a couple of, of things, kind of questions uh, for Dr. Folta. Number one, it has to do with the way that you kind of ended, and that is, you know, we're all about talking about why we care and uh, what people care about as we communicate with the public. But here's my problem. The Trump supporters talk about what they care, and that leads to a lot of false facts. And, and they care deeply about their particular issues, which of course are not based on science and not based on, talk, on, on facts. And so that's just a comment that I wanted to make. Since you brought up Monsanto, um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the other side of glyco, uh, glyco, uh, glycosate, glyphosate. Uh, there is an emerging literature about how this uh, product has made itself into the water. It's affecting communities. The FDA, in fact, has uh, now uh, um, taken an interest into adverse health outcomes. Uh, some of the things that are being reported has to do with farmers who use it getting depression and committing suicide. Uh, communities that uh, deal with agriculture and who are contaminated with this product uh, having uh, health disparities and cancers and other things. So that's the other side uh, that is part of the balance that, was, that you did not present, and I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, the reason I didn't speak to that is because when you look at those reports objectively and you look at them carefully, the, and this is a whole talk on its own, that product has been evaluated by 24 different governments over 40 years and has been shown to not be a carcinogen and has been shown, and the data have shown very conclusively that it's a, a, used as it's supposed to be used as a safe herbicide. And the health effects are, are, um, are minimal at best. The toxicity is extremely low. The acute toxicity is lower than table salt. The papers that you're talking about, there are papers that come from South America where they talk about uh, uses where they're more than 20 times what they're supposed to be applying in aerial application. Um, where, and even in those cases, they're not looking specifically at glyphosate. They're looking at cocktails of chemicals that are sprayed where they don't even know exactly what's in the, comp in the, in the, in the list. Um, it's been evaluated over and over again. The IARC came out last year and called it a probable carcinogen, but that's even being highly disputed. Um, in terms of water and such things, it has been shown to disrupt microbial communities um, and uh, water communities of, of water insects and things. It causes some changes there for sure, but that's, change of, that's true of all agricultural products, including those we use in organic production. So the trick is, is to not use that stuff around water in, in, in uh, ways that are excessive. So it's like anything, you know, it has its ups and downs, but I'm, I'm very dubious about the health claims that come from the compound based upon 40 years of, of very positive research. So we can follow up more later. Okay, I, uh, my question is to address a kind of a taboo subject, but science and capitalism and integrity in the scientific community um, I was lead poisoned severely as a child. I was sent to retarded school between first and flunking first grade a second time. I've still got a lot of intelligence, but I don't have the same tools, so I can't go to university and college. I've studied, like Darwin, animal and human behavior my entire life. I've noted that integrity seems to wane when it comes to profit. And I don't find people who are scientists, now I've lived in this university town all my adult life, scientists don't seem to have any more personal integrity or are no more apt to have problems when they grew up that affected how their psyche works, whether or not. And one of my, my biggest complaints is, is, as intellectuals, I've heard over and over again that well, you could have bettered yourself in life. You could have went to college and got one of these high-paying jobs, but instead, I wasn't given those tools, and so I have to live in a lower standard of living than, than educated stuff. So, so I was affected by the mining community who was saying the same thing as you guys. We needed these precious metals. We needed these heavy metals to make the things that make our society work and things go. But I was in a sacrifice zone. 
Um, when you showed the moth on the, on the corn, I started thinking of the monarch butterfly who was affected because that moth landed on um, with milkweed. And that wasn't expected. And so different things like that, mistakes are made. But also, I remember learning from a person orally about a doctor named Dr. Needleman. And him, like you, was smeared all over in the press and by the scientific community. He did the first studies on lead poisoning and what it does to brains. The industry, because the industry was highly funded by money and also affected by social caste on where they wanted to be, it affected how science was interpreted. And so I want to ask both of you two, as scientists, do you see a conflict in capitalism and class structure and scientific integrity? I, you know, and, and, and please don't um, take, you, you put a lot on the table there, and I'd love to talk about all of it, but I just hit the most important part. Um, I can tell you that when I look across the scientific community, and I see where we're at as who we are, and I'm talking about the majority, the vast, vast majority, you're talking about people who chose jobs in public service and jobs in public institutions that we could have taken jobs in companies and made a whole lot more money and could add a whole lot fewer hours and a lot, a lot better sailing in a lot of ways. Um, we chose these jobs because we wanted to work for the public and do work for the public. If you came down to the University of Florida on a Sunday afternoon, you'd see a parking lot full of cars from faculty. I mean, I work with people who choose to do this because it's the right thing to do for the science. There is, even if you funded me from a company, you could never get me to fake data, you could never get me to do something that would end my career because it's it's because because of the integrity issue, um, and I think that's where this all has to boil down to. Humans make mistakes, and humans are flawed, and humans always will do something wrong. But that is so so much the exception rather than the rule. And I think that we're tr we have to do a better job as scientists to talk like this tonight, have these kinds of meetings, sh talk about who we are, show our cards, be transparent, and hopefully earn your trust. I think that's the way we have to try to earn that. Um, dollars, yeah, they change the game a lot of times, but uh, but there's a lot of a, there's a very large number of people who consider themselves the watchdogs, and consider themselves the ones who are always concerned about those issues, in in more of a social context. So. I agree completely. So. I've always strived to be an incredible scientist to learn how biology works, how humans can be saved from diseases. And I've started from a young age being interested, how could a single bacteria cause disease in humans? And I'm here today to tell you that I'm driven by science. I want to understand how life works. I want to understand how vaccines work how we can save lives using the science that we're doing. And that really drives me in science. I want to understand, and I want to make life better for us. It's never been about money or profit, and I don't make a lot of money doing the research I do, and I spend so much time in the lab trying to figure out how Brucella abortus infects cells and grows inside of our cells. It causes terrible, long, chronic infection in humans. It can cause abortion and sterility in animals. Through vaccination of cattle, we've eradicated brucella from the United States. Although there's wildlife reservoirs in Yellowstone, um, wildlife reservoirs in elk and bison in Yellowstone. So we need to understand this bacteria better so we can help prevent any more outbreaks of brucellosis. So, I, my research is not driven by money. It's driven by passion to understand how our life works, how us, how, how amazing life is. So thank you for that question. And I think many scientists feel very similar to me. Hey, I just have a short question for Dr. Folta. Do you think that, so you mentioned that mostly there's like those few traits that people are selecting for in crops like that, but 
do you think that other traits like, oh, we're going to make tomatoes taste like tomatoes again is a bit more ambitious and complex genetically than, say, coding for insulin production? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, so it's a really important point that most of the traits that we're talking about in crop plants are very complex. Things like yield, things like fruit size, uh, flavors, uh, tremendously complex, relying on hundreds of genes. It should be stressed that genetic improvement in crops is best done by traditional breeding, and that's the way we've always done it. This genetic engineering business, this is a cherry on the sundae. It allows you to put in a trait that you can't do by traditional re breeding, like the insect resistance or herbicide resistance. Right. So the, the majority of these things are much better done by traditional breeding. You think that uh, the output like of, I don't know, the media attention towards it is more of the bad press about science that it tends to get, the kind of misrepresentation of science in the press, or do you think it's maybe a little bit of behind the scenes kind of trying to just generate buzz by some of the researchers and kind of get people a bit more positive about it. Well, I think that it's both. I think, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, and then bad news will always carry fast. And, you know, those lumpy rats were everywhere when they were when oh, that God. paper came out. <laughs> but at the same time, I think you're seeing a lot more press about the children that were cured from leukemia two weeks ago using a genetically engineered cell. So there's a lot of things that are coming. I think you're going to see the gene editing will be much more positive because there are traits that affect people, and I think that'll be a good thing. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so obviously there's a lot of advantages for genetically modified organisms, um, but I was wondering what you would say to the argument that clearer labeling, um, especially on consumer products, can increase um, traceability and accountability for some of these big organizations and really enhance that communication between consumers um, and the corporations um, and build on that trust. Uh, and the whole time there's been this labeling discussion, I've been all for voluntary labeling. I think it's great to, here's what's in the product, you know. I, I don't like the fact that we try to do legislation to mandate it for a lot of different reasons. But basically because what's the difference between soybean oil from a genetically engineered plant and soybean oil from a non-genetically engineered plant? Both of them are soybean oil. And there's nothing magical or compositionally different between them. And so that's where it starts to get strange in terms of a label, because a label should say, what's in the bottle? And so it, it, it does get into a nuanced discussion. I think more information is better. I think transparency is, is tantamount. And I would love to see, and as is happening, manufacturers coming out and saying, hey, this is made with genetically engineered ingredients. And, and, and I think that uh, shows us the prevalence of it and helps us understand it better. Cool. Thanks. Well, first off, I just wanted to say um, thank you, Dr. Folta, for bringing up um, particularly the vitamin A deficiency in regards to um, the genetically modified crops. One of the things that got me very much interested in the debate on this was learning about golden rice in the 90s and the continued public backlash against that to solve uh, to solve a epidemic in Southeast Asia. And so I wanted to say thank you very much for that. Um, and to... Uh, Dr. Miller, um, in regards to research in vaccination and and resisting against diseases, and I'm just curious on what what uh, research, um, if you can talk about it, has gone into solving some of the more the rise of vaccination resistant diseases, particularly um, resistant tuberculosis that's coming out of Eastern Europe and and Russia due to um, the constant exposure to that and these and these and this virus becoming more pre prevalent in the West and so I was just curious about that. Thank you. That's actually a very good question and I can't answer that. <laughs> um, I can throw in one neat little nugget on that is that tuberculosis is also a problem in cattle and they've used gene editing to create cows which don't get tuberculosis. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> Hi, I have a question um, about vaccines. So we had a, um, I go to school at Wazoo for veterinary medicine, um, and we had a, um, like a flu vaccination day. And so I was running around trying to get everybody to go get their vaccine because it was literally across the hall. And I was really surprised at how many people said um, they had this idea that getting the vaccine made, they got the flu anyway, and that they thought they got it worse, or that it made them feel sick afterwards. 
Um, and so I tried to look that up a little bit and it seemed like that's just kind of a belief that people have. But I was wondering if you can speak to that more, not just about the flu vaccine, but maybe about other vaccines. And so like if we can talk to those people and say, actually, there's, you know, um, some evidence, maybe not statistics, but that, uh, <laughs> that that's not, that not, not really a thing, you know? So I was hoping you could explain that a little bit more. Sure. So the flu shot changes about every year. They go out and try to figure out the most frequent influenza infections that are happening in the area. And they're doing the best job they can to find the strains that you may be exposed to. So your shots are hopefully able to protect you from the influenza that's around you. Um, now, uh, people do get mild side effects from vaccines. My dad got one in his nose and got a mild case of the flu, and that does happen in a small portion of the people. And yes, for your immune system to make a robust memory B cell development, you may feel mild symptoms, but it's nowhere near what you would feel if you got the actual flu. And if you get the flu and you're around young children or elderly, you're putting them at risk to death. There, it's already in a few weeks into our flu season already, and there was already reported five deaths in infants. So you're helping protect those that cannot get the flu vaccine. So it, it's a very good idea. Uh, given that these technologies sort of uh, perpetuate a positive feedback loop where population continues to grow, how do we define limits? Who does that? And... Um, what are the difficulties associated there? And then I love this question because here's the, here's the story. You know, we look at it, all right, we're going to feed more people and make them healthier. That's the fastest way to curb population. And when you take care of people, when you educate them, when you have them full bellies, you have them able to take on other, other uh, options in life, not worried about their potential to have families and kids because their children won't die under five years old. If you take care of people, they have fewer of us. And I think that's been borne out in studies through, or in the numbers throughout Scandinavian countries and even in this country a bit. So I think the best move to, to take care of the future is to take care of people. And then the rest of it will sort out from there. Brilliant minds together can solve problems. So we're here together to try to solve the problems of our future. I think there's a lot of evidence for... Um, GMOs are good for agriculture and they're not harmful to people, but one concern that I've heard or that I've had um, is what happens when these things get out into natural ecosystems. So an example is, you know, BT corn, it's bad for pests, but what happens when it gets into the water system? What happens to natural invertebrate communities? But I was just wondering what sort of evidence is there, like for and against? No, there, there actually are there, there actually are a couple papers that talk about BT corn detritus and it gets into creeks and stuff and some negative effects on crayfish and, and uh, on fish uh, issues like glyphosate and uh, fish development not major differences but differences you can measure and so these things are looked at very carefully uh, water communities as I mentioned earlier with the uh, invertebrates and things that you do have impacts from agriculture. Now, that said, the impacts are much lower than other methods that we've used in the past. So we're on a good trajectory there. Um, the fact that we're seeing resistance in the insects in weeds, meaning that we have to bring back old legacy pesticides, that's not good, but that's the direction we're going. And so what it means is we need to be better with innovation. And I don't think the idea here is, because we can measure some negative impacts, is a reason to abandon the technology because it's all about risks and benefits. It's important we monitor them, it's important we understand them. But I think getting vitamin A in those, you know, in the, in the rice and cassava and bananas and using the technology to do some good things, maybe we could change the way we deal with herbicide resistance and insect resistance. You know, let's not vilify a technology and condemn a technology because we have a few negative little ends that we can measure. I think that's really, really important. But good question. Thank you very much for two great talks. I'm a faculty member in chemistry in Idaho, and uh, I really sympathize with the personal attacks that you demonstrated. I think that's horrible. When I was a postdoc, I contradicted somebody about fluoride toxicity in a public way, and, um, and my email box was sent to 
a hundred thousand people and I, I got attacked with a lot of emails. So I, I understand that. So I've thought about this idea of engaging with the public and what it means. And I personally think that some of this role should be taken on by the NIH, the NSF, the FDA. They don't seem to defend themselves. That there is no marketing wing for scientists. You want to comment on that? Why is it the, the podcast and the skeptic society that's defending you and not the people that, that should be doing it? Right? No, that's, you know, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. The American Society for Plant Biologists, a very strong organization, that when this happened to me last year, they were livid. And the president and other people were so upset. They were ready to go to bat and take out a full page ad in the New York Times, same paper that threw me under the bus and they're gonna spend money there. All right, sure. So um, they go to do this, but the problem is, as soon as they go to, to do this, the people who are in charge of their PR said, no, 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 you don't wanna go there. You know, let them twist in the wind. You don't want them coming after you. And when I go to scientific meetings, I have scientists come up to me and hug me and say, I'm so sorry what happened to you. I have people who say, I wish that I could stand up and defend, my, defend you for this, but I don't want my family getting harassed. I mean, this is what the times we live in. Look what Michael Mann goes through with climate and Paul Offit with vaccines. I mean, these people get death threats. I did too, but you know, that's how you deal with it. But, but so, what do you, so I, I don't know how to, how to deal with this other than the simple way of if everybody got in and we all took 15 minutes a week to just share science, whether we like these technologies or not, to have a real discussion in public space. That's how this gets solved is just by an honest dialogue. You know, and I always say I could be wrong. Let's talk about evidence and get, make it right. So. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think that it's a really difficult issue. And I didn't get any death threats, but emails to say, I'll see you in the parking lot and where you work and this and that. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's scary, you know? Yeah, it, it, and it is, it is the thing, it doesn't bother me nearly as much as it bothers my family, as much as it bothers my assistant, as much as it bothers my lab. Um, that people, that we had to take my name off the laboratory. That when a package comes from FedEx or UPS to my house, we leave it outside until we know where it came from. Um, I've had to uh, interact with domestic terrorism task force of the FBI because of this, because of credible threats. Um, I had to cancel coming here last year because of this. And uh, a lot of this, in, so when you live in that, I mean, that's almost the definition of terrorism, you know, living under fear for your own life because of ide ideological differences. And uh, so I don't get too nervous about it. I, I, I think we all need to just have a little, we can't make decisions based on fear. And whether it's talking, and you know, I don't mean to throw in a political thing here, but in the environment now where we're told that people from certain countries could be trouble, or people from this should be banned, or whatever, we can't make decisions based on fear. We have to be strong enough to, to, to use evidence and data to make our decisions. Hello. Thank you again so much. Um, your talks were very uh, inspiring and really uh, so needed. Thank you so much. Um, my question is about a very specific thing that maybe a lot of us have, have run into. Say there's someone in your life close to you, a friend, a family member, that you perhaps might have burned a few bridges with on these issues. And you've, you've, <laughs> what, what I'm saying For is, <laughs> it's, what I'm saying is it's gone to a place that's just hurt the relationship and you really don't know how to bounce back from that. My question to you is, what is a bone that we can throw them? What is something that we can agree on that's very common rhetoric on the other side of the issue that can help us relate and show that we do care about the same things? What, uh, from, from both of you, if you don't mind, what are some things that we can go to those people and say, hey, we really are on the same team here? Do you want me to hit this first? Or you want to so the, the, the answer to that is to say to somebody, I understand, and the most potent words in the human dialogue are, I'm sorry and I understand how you would feel that way. We learn so much about science communication from hostage negotiation. It sounds crazy, but it's true. Um, what we need to do is you need to, you need to, as a listener, as somebody in this dialogue, you need to understand what that person thinks. What's their lens? You know, and this goes back to the comment that was made right off the top about how other people believe in their hearts. You have to understand how they feel and why they feel that way, because to them, that's their reality. And before you can change it, you need to understand that. And so start there. 
and, and, and share that dialogue about why they feel the way they do. And then go into, well, let me show you what I know and, and, and approach it. I completely agree, and I also think it's very important that you sit and listen to every detail that they tell you about why they're concerned. Listen exactly what stems their fears in whatever situation you're talking about, whether it's vaccination or GMOs. Why are they concerned? And then bring up your concerns about what makes you afraid what scares you in terms of vaccines and disease? I'm deathly afraid of dying from these infectious diseases. I work with one that's a BSL-3 organism where I have to be suited up, and I have nightmares about it. And so my fear is that these small organisms could take over my body and kill me. And so share what, what really is deep down making you afraid. And then hopefully you can come to some sort of agreement there. So I, I work for a, a grower organization, a group of farmers. And basically, I have a very interesting job. I, I give money out to scientists. All right. And we study crop production, health, and nutrition of our crop. So one of the challenges that we have is, should we fund research for the health benefits of this crop because sometimes the public sees this industry-funded research as tainted. Um, absolutely fund it, because <laughs> um, no, and, and that's the problem, is that, you know, there, it, but that's, that's an issue of trust, right? It is. And, and I think what it gets down to is, it, and transparency, I think what it boils down to is, is that it's not good enough for us to be transparent, we have to be super obvious. And by making data publicly available, by putting it all out there, and it's such a pain to have to go through what I go through to be so, as transparent as I am, but it's important. We just have to say, here are all the data, that you look at it and see if you come to the same conclusion. And the other thought too is, how well does our data fit with what's already known? Do we just expand the current paradigm? And if we do go against the current rules and come up with a deal breaker and say, all right, we, we just contradicted everything we know, we have to be able to stand by that with even more data and fortification. But the only way that we ever get anywhere is by funding of more science. So thank you, and please keep doing more. Thanks. And let me know how I can participate, <laughs> as long as you're not with certain companies. <laughs> so my question is for Dr. Fulta. Uh, in a case of a picture being worth a thousand words, you showed uh, the mice with the tumors on one of your slides there. That, I assume, was from the uh, Seralini study. Uh, could you go briefly into what some of the problems with the Seralini study were? Um, we only have a couple minutes. <laughs> um, yeah. th there are so many problems with that study, and it really had to do with small sample size, inappropriate statistics, inadequate statistics. Um, those three mice really kind of frame the basic problem. They used a rat model that is prone to cancer during the time frame that they used. So 77% of mice without any treatment uh, develop tumors at that level. And they show those three rats that have tumors, apparently eating genetically engineered food, they left out the control, who if you look at table two, also got tumors. So when a author group omits the control deliberately, because you have to, you made a, they made a decision to not include the mouse that didn't eat the stuff, they made that decision to omit that because it's in the table and not in the, in the figure of the lumpy, mice, the lumpy rats. And that kind of just says to me right there, I saw that and I said right here, throw the whole thing away. Um, you could go into that one all day, but good question. And it should be known that they've sim since used the same rats in the same framework to go into deeper studies of organs and tissues of those rats, which is really rather suspect when you start with shaky work to continue it. So. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and one last thanks to the American Human Association, Humanist the Palouse, and the University of Idaho Secular Student Alliance for helping us to put this event together. I'd also like to give a big shout out to the core group of Humanist of the Palouse and Secular Student Alliance members who worked very hard to organize and execute this event. Darwin on the Palouse would not be possible with all of your hard work. 
And finally, I'd like us all to, uh, to join together to personally thank Dr. Miller and Dr. Fulta for coming here tonight to share their knowledge and their advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thank you.